All right. So what we can do, the important thing I'm trying to show here is that we can trace the execution of this utility that we just wrote. We can see when we call this utility, we can trace every single call we make into the kernel to perform uh, whatever the function we want the kernel to perform on our, half is, on our behalf is going to be. When we ask it to return the current user ID, uh, it shows up in the listening here. So you use the strace command and you can see every single thing your application is asking the kernel to do on your behalf. That's what strace does. Okay? So it's on your system. Play around with it. It's one of the standard debugging tools that you have. You've all seen GDB, or you've probably all heard of GDB if you've done any C development. You've got tools like strace sitting there you can use to figure out, okay, what was my application doing? What was it trying to get the system to do for us? So that's the whole point of the last couple of slides. As I said, if you really want to go into the example, it's on the website, you can download it. Um, knock yourselves out. Okay. So, this is the next bit I want to just address here again is on this slide here, we talk about these system utilities. I just want to quickly touch on this. Again, this is a very kind of quick overview of the system. I know I'm rushing through this, but I want to get on to the more sort of sexy, interesting stuff. So what the system tools and utilities do? Well, the kernel provides some functions that we can use for which there's no kind of standard way of um, you know, using that functionality. We have to have a special uh, interface, a special mechanism. For example, the new event stuff in kernel 2.6. I plug in my device, I get notifications propagating up into my user space programs telling me something's happening. Uh, we need ways to handle this kind of thing. Uh, we have these things called I ioptals. Again, another sort of special case uh, type of function I can use to communicate with my kernel. It's completely out of band. It's nothing to do with sort of standard programming practice. And there are many other tools and utilities on your system that are using these kind of special case um, interfaces. So these things sitting over here. Okay. We're not worrying about that today, I'm just mentioning it. We're worrying about this, and then we're worrying about what's happening inside the kernel here. So. Okay. Here's the example I gave just now of something a little bit different to do with utilities that get called inserting a USB stick. But again, I don't want to dwell on that too much. I want to get on to the kind of internals. So, all right. Let's look at the kernel itself. That's more interesting than looking at the system as a whole. That's what we're here for today. Okay, so what's the history of Linux? Well, I think we all know that Linux is, you know, dates back to 1991. We've probably seen Linus's original posting when he announces he's working on this small operating system. Won't be big and interesting like Unix, or however he said it. Um, the point I want to make is that, okay, so that was an Intel 386 machine in 1991. But it wasn't too long after that that people started using Linux on lots of different kinds of machines. That, you know, Linux had never envisaged that it would be used on these. So, the Motorola 68000 was an early uh, adopter. We had Spark. TiVo's interesting. The uh, PBR company, yeah? The Alpha. Alpha, yeah, I didn't, it's not an exhaustive list, but uh, the Alpha was an early one as well, absolutely. Um, and again, I should have probably, considering I'm in Boston, I probably should have put Alpha on that list. Yeah, because we actually demoed Linux on the Alpha in what, 94 or 93? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Again, I should have put it up with it. Anyway, but, um, so the reason I wanted to mention TiVo there is because everyone's heard of TiVo, right? Whether you know of Linux or not, everybody's heard of TiVo. Everyone in the US and pretty much everywhere, everywhere else as well. But the TiVo was very interesting um, because in 1998, when they started working on this, they decided to use Linux. They decided that, you know, Linux was not really geared up for what they wanted to do with it, but 
we don't care, we're going to, we're going to make it do what we want, we're going to adapt it, we're going to make it work on our devices. So if you look through the Linux source code, you'll see the name TiVo mentioned a lot of times, especially in the PowerPC part of the Linux kernel, uh, where they, which is what their system is based on. I said mobile phones there, sorry, these slides are based on a talk I gave in London. Of course, I mean cell phone in the US, but a large number of cell phones now are also running Linux. Okay, I don't have any with me today, but somebody probably has one somewhere. Okay? Um, we now support 20 different architectures. I'll go into what an architecture is. I'll explain these terms a bit later on, if you don't know what they mean. And it's relatively easy to add more. Now, new architectures don't come out very often. You know, we've heard of um, Intel 386, the IA32, which is the technical term for it. We've heard of Motorola, we've heard of Spark, we've heard of these different terms. We don't tend to get new architectures very often. But you can add more if you want. Also, early on in Linux development, we added kernel module support. So, pretty early on, it becomes possible to extend the kernel after it's running. So you want to add support for a new device, new hardware, okay, you can do that, and even after your system is booted. Now, today, if you're using Solaris or a proprietary Unix system, you know, that's not big news to you, you can do it there as well. But when this started happening in Linux, you know, there weren't too many systems, too many other Unix <coughs> systems or Unix-like systems out there where true um, module support existed. <coughs> We also have evolving documentation, new sites, and I'm going to give you some links at the end that point to some more resources. So, getting hold of the Linux kernel. Well, I think everyone's heard of kernel.org. If you haven't, then um, that's the website. Sorry about the blue. That's um, open office, uh, converting links to blue. But you can get hold of the source in two different ways. You can get hold of an archive that contains the latest Linux kernel sources from the website. Or you can use uh, one of the development tools that I'll go into in a moment for getting kind of the state of the art, tracking what's currently going on. If you just want to check out any Linux kernel, go to kernel.org, find the latest kernel. As of today, it's called 2618.2. Download the archive, unpack it, and that's what you'll see within it. Thousands of files, um, probably under those directories there. Regular development is tracked using a tool called Git. Some people pronounce it JIT. Um, and the point of Git is to allow distributed development. So we have developers here, we have developers in Europe, we have developers in Asia, people all over the place who all want to contribute, and that has to be done in a globally distributed fashion. So some of us know the history here. For those of us who don't, um, various tools have been used in the past, and roughly speaking, a year ago, the tool that was being used, the license changed, became non-free, it was not possible for the Linux development community to continue to use it in the way that it had been used. Um, and Linus Torvalds, who's obviously famous for writing the operating system itself, decided to write a tool to uh, track development, a source code management tool. Um, and as we know, now, within two weeks, he had re-implemented all of the functionality that was necessary. So two weeks, he goes from having nothing, he says, OK, I'll be back in a week or two. And he comes back and says, hey, look at this. And of course, it does everything that they wanted, and he'd done the work of a company in two weeks. You know, that's the sort of thing that happens. If you follow the website, kernel.org forward slash git. You can download this tool. Uh, you can use the, the command git pull on a daily basis to find out you know, what's, what's changed, pull down the latest changes to the kernel uh, from the kernel.org website. Again, on the website there, it will tell you how to do this. Don't worry too much about writing this down. The slides are online anyway, so don't worry too much about that. The key point being, we use this tool to pull down sources on a daily basis, and we follow, follow along what's going on using the Linux kernel mailing list as a reference. And the kernel mailing list basically is kind of 
Well, it's where all the, it's where all the open discussion happens. You know? I'm not going to say private discussion doesn't happen between kernel developers. Of course it does, right? Because you know, they want to debate issues and they do have private exchanges. But for the most part, the development of Linux is far more open than any other system. Okay? And a good way of tracking it, if you don't want to subscribe to the mailing list where you're going to have hundreds and hundreds of emails all the time, is to go to lkml.org, which is a third-party site that sort of nicely tracks all of the kernel threads, shows you what's most popular, shows you, you know, who said the most interesting thing this week based on the number of people who've looked at the email thread and all that kind of thing. It's a very interesting resource. Um, and later in the slide, later in the presentation, I'll show you some resources, including Linux Weekly News. Linux Weekly News is a great website to check out, lwn.net. And what they have there is a weekly email that goes out, kind of updating you with what's going on um, in the Linux kernel community this week, and also in other different communities too. But their coverage is far more comprehensive than, you know, even if you sit there and read every email, even if you, you, know, you have that time to do that, somehow their coverage is even more comprehensive than that. They really, really do know what they're doing, and they really do have a lot of great people contributing to the stories that they put out. You can also use a tool called GitK, which is uh, a graphical tool, rather than kind of trying to go through all the, the textual output of the Git command itself. You can use GitK, you can visualize what changes happened to the kernel today. Okay, and if you read through the documentation, I'll explain more, but I'll just point out a couple of things to you. The key one being that Linux kernel development does not happen in terms of changes to a file, okay? We have this concept of a change set. So we don't change one file, we don't change one thing, we change a group of things, okay? And that more accurately reflects actual software development, okay? It's not John changed foo.c, it's John changed some stuff in order to fix bug number whatever, right? That's more along the lines of how people actually write software. So Linux kernel uh, development happens in that way as well. Changes are tracked in terms of change sets. So we can trivially and easily say, okay, change set number, whatever, introduced a bug, um, let's back it out. And it will pull out all the different changes that were made in that change set. So that's what you see when you um, go through the list here. You're seeing collections of changes to the kernel. And you'll get a nice log, ridiculously long. We're, we're now at the point where, on a monthly basis, more changes happen to the kernel than, you know, at, at some times in the past it has been in total size, right? So we're looking at like 10, 20, maybe 30 meg worth of changes to the kernel in a very short space of time, okay? Huge numbers of changes are happening all the time. New features get added, things get removed, okay, and pretty soon that the, the size of the changes does add up to quite ridiculous sizes, it really does. So you can check out this tool, it's pretty cool. It's probably already in your distribution, so you can just um, apt get, yum get, like, yum install, sorry, or uh, you know, whatever your favorite tool or command is. Another source of, uh, another source for the Linux kernel is your vendor that you've got your Linux distribution from. So, you know, you installed Fedora, okay, well it went, your Linux kernel source went in there, but, you know, different distributions have it in different places. The point being, um, your vendor has supplied a copy of the Linux kernel source along with the distribution. They've made changes to it. Okay, vendors make changes to the Linux kernel um, as part of the process of their development. What they do is they add fixes or known issues that, in, that specifically affect them and their customers. Okay, they add other uh, features that are being currently worked on that are maybe not in the official Linux kernel yet, but will be soon. Maybe they'll put a cute penguin uh, logo or change the penguin to a comedian or, you know, whatever. I mean, all kinds of fixes get added. So it's not the same as the Linux kernel you could download from kernel.org, uh, which means that it's 